Welcome, everybody. Good to see you this morning. Getting warmer, so it's really good. And welcome to everybody who's watching online uh, next week or in the weeks ahead. Um, this morning takes, well, remember a year ago, we've had that phrase running through our heads where it said, be careful how you listen to God. And uh, that is still ringing out. And uh, this morning, I'd like us to continue to bear that in mind. Because I don't know if you're a bit like me, um, there's some been really, some really quite, I think, influential prophetic words that have been going out, and you'll have seen them on, on uh, the church chat. And I think God is, and the church is slowly beginning to comprehend what God is saying to us. And uh, part of this meeting, and particularly this, the first section of the meeting, it will be us listening to God and responding to him. So uh, just going to open up in prayer. And then after that, I'm just going to say we're going to have a, a, a couple of pro a quite extensive time, probably about 10 or 15 minutes of, of worship. It's simply two songs which invite us to, for God to come down by his spirit and move amongst us, even through this amazing uh, technology of Zoom. And if you're a bit like me, you come to a meeting, you, you've, got to be, you've got to prepare yourself. So we're just going to have a couple of minutes preparing ourselves. There's a lovely bit of scripture right the way through scripture where God says we can have as much of him as we want. Can't remember where it is, but there's a, an old text in scripture where a king comes up to um, a person and says and gives him a, a, a mug and says, give him as much as he wants. And I sense that God is saying to us and to the church, church, you can have as much of me as you want to drink of. We can hear as much of him as we want to hear and as we, we want to respond. So I'm going to open up in prayer and then I'm going to uh, read out a little prayer, a, a, a sentence of a line, and even with us muted in your own homes, I'd like you just to respond by saying those same words. Because I want, I want you and myself to be prepared for this morning. To literally want to hear and drink the dregs of everything that God has got for us this morning by his spirit. There's quite a diversity of things going to happen. And I don't want, I don't want to miss, and I don't want us as a church to miss what God's saying. I want you in your hearts to sense that God is going to speak to you profoundly by his spirit. So, Father, thank you for our gathering. Thank you that you love people coming together in your name. And, Lord, we've come together in the name of Jesus the one that we love, our saviour, our friend. And quite openly before you, Father, we want you to speak to us. We want to you to move by your spirit. We want to worship you. We want to give you all the Jew that's worthy to you. But we want to enter into your presence together. I want to ask you, Father, that each one of us would sense your spirit moving upon us this morning. We'd literally interact with you at a deep level. So I'm going to read out. These are, this is one of the verses of the songs that we're going to sing just in a minute. And I'll do it bit by bit. And I'd like you to say it out in your own homes. All right. So here we go. King Jesus, 
You're the name we're lifting high. Your glory shaking up the earth and skies. Revival. We want to see your kingdom here. We want to see your kingdom here. Spirit, break out. Break our walls down. Spirit, break out. Heaven, come down. Amen. And we're going to sing two songs that are going to run on, one after the other. They may be new to you, but it doesn't matter. These are songs that are written and sung to enter into. They are, they are the call of God's people set to music. They are songs to enter into with your heart and with your spirit and with an act of worship. We wrote this song um, really to set the tone for a meeting, um, expectancy for what God is going to do. And it was inspired by a section in Isaiah 42 where it says, Behold, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. We really believe that God is on the move, that we are expectant for him to breathe and do something new in our meetings, in our lives. And so this song was inspired by that scripture.
I know that was a very long song, but it touches, oh, it touches your spirit as much as it does mine. So we're just gonna have a few few minutes just to respond to pray. And if you do, we're gonna keep muted, everybody muted, but if you want to respond and pray, just unmute yourself. So allow the Spirit of God to come upon us together. Lord, we love you. We respond to you together as a community of people, your church, longing for you, deep longing for you. I, I just want to share, church, listen, <laughs> if it's wrong, then reject it. But listening to one of the songs, we are ready. I felt the spirit say to me, we're not ready. We're not ready. And this scripture came to me. So I'm just going to read it. We have a God of truth and grace, but we need to often hear hard things. And um, it says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And I just sensed within that, as well as reading John this week, where Jesus had to, um, I've laid this down and it's come with me and I can't let it go and I want to cry. So I'm just trusting it's the spirit. When Jesus had to drive out at the temple, he brought a cleansing. Could we, through them, they were blocking the way to Jesus. And because of where we're at, we may need a cleaning out, a re, a, just a re-coming back to God with all our hearts, because in that we could be blocking others to the Lord where he isn't high and lifted up in our life. So I think God wants to pour out, but I think we need to pour out before God what, where the Holy Spirit is touching us in repentance. It doesn't come with condemnation. We are free in Christ, but as the Spirit speaks to us individually or corporately, um, just to come and then we can have more of a filling um, so I just bring that and then if it's wrong then I accept but I just had to say that had to speak that out sorry if it's wrong no, I, I, I said that's that's right whenever there's an outpouring of God's spirit there's always repentance and we as part of our listening to God as church Lord, I want to say Lord, forgive us when we missed the mark. Forgive us when we blocked the move of your spirit. When we've done it individually and as a church, forgive us. But Lord, in your, in your mercy and grace, pour out your spirit in these days as you're wanting to do, as you're doing. Thank you, Lord. I do believe there are other people who just want to just say some things, very simple, responding to God, that we just cannot create that river for him to pour, pour in. Just wanted to share that um, I just felt God remind me of the people who were surrounding Jesus as he was walking on this earth and they just had faith to touch his hem not just that one woman but people who who touched his the hem of his cloak and just felt that he was who he was um, they got healing and I just I just felt God say to me to touch his spiritual hem and just to believe that he he has the power for healing not just for physical healing but emotional healing just everything that perhaps COVID has torn from people he just wants us to reach out to him and touch his hem and just to believe that he is who he is and that he will he will heal us um, if we but we need to reach out to him in faith thank you we're going to break into smaller groups now to take communion together and um, maybe that's a, a more appropriate place for just us to pray for one another 
uh, to hear what God's saying and just to call out to the Lord to continue his work, uh, pour out his spirit amongst us. So, Richard, if you could break us into um, smaller groups, maybe four, four groups, and we'll break bread together. Feel free, feel free, you don't have to be bound up by religious words, break it, share, pray for one another, and uh, listen to what God is saying. Well, I pray that God bless you in the breaking of bread. Um, we're going to now do something that we want to introduce um, on, a, on a regular basis. And I, I suppose it, I've told you this story before, but I once went on a holiday to Dublin with Jen. And of course, when you go to Dublin, you've got to go into the pub and have a Guinness. So I was at the bar um, getting a, a drink and... Um, this unknown person came up right up to me and just said, looked at me and said, well, tell me your story. And uh, we had a little chat uh, for, a, for a few minutes and I told him a bit about my life story. We're going to introduce this little section, um, little interview that Andy's going to lead, um, where he's going to invite someone to tell them their story. So over to you, Andy. Well, morning, Louis. Be good to see you this morning, fella, and Carol in the background. Oh. <laughs> uh, tell me, Matt, uh, you've been up here a while now, haven't you? Up in, in, in the raising area. What what brought you up here in the first place? Because you're not from around this part, are you, like me? No, no. I'm originally from Essex, a little place called Canvey Island. Um, I met Carol... 2006 and we both needed a new start um so we decided to move up this way in 2007. ah why did one new start were you uh, i mean yeah. were, were, were people after you in essex and you and you left a trail of destruction and heavy debts well or, or that with the local mobsters yeah in a manner of speaking sort of thing it's just time for a, <laughs> a new chapter in the life shall we say oh, yeah. That, that's as far as you're going with that, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so why, why, for any particular reason, why did you did you know anybody up here in the time? Yeah, my friend, Mar friend Martin, who I've known for a lot, a lot of years now. Um, he moved, he moved this way. I can't remember now. Must oh, be two, two thousands or before that. And his parents moved here before then. So through visiting and stuff, got to love the area and just thought it'd be ideal for Carol and I as a new start. All right. So you and um so you, you moved up. I, I gather you telling me earlier that you lived in Tilby first before decamp in the North Willingham. Um, and is that right? You were working at, at Travis at the builder's yard when something quite momentous happened that really did. Yeah, on a couple. I had a couple of jobs when I first moved up um, and then decided to get a job at Travis Perkins and the idea was to work my way through the ranks, as you do. But unfortunately, I had, a, I had an accident at work, which was, a, shall we say, life-changing. Yeah, it was a, actually not just any old accident. It's something what, that you're still living with the consequences now and will do forever. That's right, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a permanent, dam permanent damage to myself. Yeah. Um, I gather that you you were undergoing some treatment in hospital, or you'd been in and out, when uh, Estelle, Martin's wife, came came to visit, um, and it turned out to be quite a, a significant visit. Yeah, we'd been invited to church walks on a Sunday for quite a little while, really. We got to meet a few of the people there, and... Um, I'd, I'd, I'd hurt myself when I was in hospital, and um, been there for three weeks then. And Estelle took the bold step to give me this envelope. She said to me to, to read it after they'd gone. And in it was a little envelope 
introducing herself as a Christian. And she would wrote a lovely letter to me about how it's helped her and how it could help me. And things just fell into place. Why mad? That I, I needed this person on my side. Because I was in such a deep and low place. And was that was that the sort of moment you gave your life to Jesus? You, you, it was. Or was it a build up to that? Or it it was the build up to it. It started the ball rolling. Yeah. It got me thinking more and more and more. Um, started to go to church as well. <coughs> I was going to mute the dog. <laughs> Come on, then. Um, yeah, yes, so, you still give me the letter, say, back 2011. 2012, uh, did an alpha course. Yeah, how was that? That was With the Bob. alpha course. That was really good. If anyone's got any questions, whether they know lots or, low, or know nothing, it's the ideal place to talk about these things. Mm. And if, if you do know, an amount, there's things you don't know. It, it's really great. Um, then got baptised 2013. Amen. Praise God. What's that? Really With, you were part of this church. I was, yeah. All Paul, the way through this thing, yeah? Yeah, Paul baptised me. Mm-hmm. And then things got moved on a bit further because I thought I'd never be married and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and then the following year, uh, Carol got baptised. Amen. And then we both got married. Oh. So it was just how things have changed so much. And for the better. Yeah, and, and the health, I mean, your health situation is just something you, 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 you've learned to accept to live with it. Yeah, it's a bit a bit like my roller coaster, I'll call it. Yeah. You get your good days, you get your bad days, but he's that constant. He's always there for you. Is that that crutch you can depend on, someone you can discuss things with, um, <laughs> and I, I I do believe he's he's helped keep keeping me upright, just to carry on and do the things I can do. Right, amen. Thanks, Luke. I mean, on the road because now, like we were in the little group, we were praying with over communion. We were we were praying as on the journey. Are there any, any other significant sort of milestones uh, to bring us to where we are today? That today? In your, in your growth? Yep, yeah, sorry. Um, 2019 did a, um, the Quest course. And that was a real eye-opener. That was a real, wow. Took about, that's that quality time just thinking about you and the father yeah. and realising how close you really are. It truly, truly amazing. Mm. And do you have, I mean, where do you see yourself? I mean, now we're, we're sitting here talking together. Is the Lord leading you with any big plans for the future or is it a, a day to day and see what he brings? At the moment it's day to day, Andy. Yeah, uh, I've got a few more health problems to work through at the moment, um, so it's just get those resolved, and who knows what the future holds. Absolutely, it's in his hands, isn't it? But I, I give thanks every morning to him that you know it's a, another morning, um, and just see what the day brings. Well, thank you, Louis, for sharing a little bit of your story with us this morning, and. and May God continue to bless you and keep you as you and Carol grow deeper and further in both knowledge and the love of him. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Andy. Well, that was great. Hope you enjoyed that. Thumbs up for that. Brilliant. And uh, hopefully that'll be part of our our regular slots on the Sunday morning as we go through it. We'll hear some more stories. Someone coming up and saying, tell us your story. So that's good. Well, I hope you're getting uh, as much as I am out of the uh, John's Gospel. We're now at that stage where Jesus is about to enter the temple. So uh, we'll now hand over to Rona. 
Morning everyone. I hope we're all really ready to uh, continue our journey through John's Gospel together this morning. Uh, thank you Mike and Andy and Paul for encouraging us all and helping us to go deeper into the Word and to connect more fully with who Jesus was and is. And hopefully we'll continue to do that this morning as well. We've heard so much so far, haven't we? And yet we're only halfway through chapter two. Anyway, I get the sense that uh, it's going to be a very significant journey together through through this year as we continue to study John's gospel together. Let's remind ourselves again just why John wrote this gospel. That we may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing we might have life in his name. That's in John chapter 20 and verse 31. Believing in Jesus and going on believing is so important for everyone. Let's pray before we start looking in more detail at the passage in, uh, in the second half of chapter 2. Father God, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, to earth, full of truth and grace. Radical, yet reflecting your glory. Ready to serve and to save. To be compassionate, to confront sin and to exercise authority in a right way. And to change lives forever. Oh Lord, how we long to be more like you and full of your ways by the power of your spirit. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when we don't spend enough time with you to know you more. Help us, Lord, to immerse ourselves in your word this morning, to hear you individually and as a church. Please highlight things for us that you want to reveal to us and things you want us to act on and change. Let more of your kingdom come, Lord, and more of your will be done. In Jesus' name. Amen. At the point we're in, in John's Gospel, chapter 2 and verse 13, we're about to hit quite a lot of turbulence. This might not be quite the right analogy for either biblical times or, or indeed COVID times, but uh, if you've ever experienced turbulence at 22,000 feet whilst you've been on an aircraft, it comes with a degree of shock and confusion, like, what's happening? Am I safe? And maybe the turbulence that ensues in, as Jesus enters the temple in Jerusalem feels a bit like that as we read John's Gospel here. There have been numerous shifts in tempo and atmosphere all within the space of a few verses. If you've got your Bibles open, look at verse 11. Jesus was in a, a rural village in Galilee and by th verse 13, He's in a bustling, thronging city with loads of people there for Passover. He, he was in the north and now he's 70 miles further south in Jerusalem. In Cana at, at the wedding, he was quietly trying to keep a low profile. And in Jerusalem, he's now pretty much centre stage in a noisy, dramatic scene in the temple precincts, full of rage and right, righteous anger. In Cana, Jesus acts compassionately. In Jerusalem, he's very confrontational, to say the least. So many contrasts in just a few verses. One significant similarity, though, is that Jesus' disciples are with him on both occasions. And John has probably juxtaposed them, put them together for, for a very good reason. The passage we'll cover today is from uh, verse 13 to 25 of chapter 2. It's a passage of two halves, really. 
with a pretty big question in the middle and then a very different um, second half, as it were. A sh another shift as Jesus replies in verse 19. Let's read the first part. Let's look at it together. So verses 13 to 16. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. To those who sold doves, he said, Get out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. I did actually think of asking you all to unmute yourselves and provide relevant sound effects on Zoom. But even the cacophony of Zoom sound, I don't think, would do justice to the volume of noise and action and chaos here. Clutter, clatter and confusion everywhere, which hardly seems seemly for a, such a holy setting as the temple in Jerusalem. I don't, by the way, want to get embroiled in a discussion about whether Jesus cleared or cleansed the temple, as it's sometimes called, on one or two occasions. It could actually be more, since not everything Jesus did is written down, as John tells us in uh, chapter 21 and verse 25. As many of you are aware, Matthew, Mark and Luke, the synoptic gospels, which Paul reminded of us last week, all put Jesus's dramatic cleansing of the temple episode into the last week of Jesus's life um, before the crucifixion. Whereas John puts it here right at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. What we do know is John records other occasions when Jesus was in Jerusalem, several in fact, and, and the other uh, Gospels don't, only in that last week. Um, during his, his three-year ministry in John's Gospel, we find Jesus in Jerusalem in chapter 5, in chapter 7, in chapter 10, and in chapter 12. We know the other Gospels are written more chronologically than John, but it's quite possible that the cleansing of the temple could have happened more than once. More importantly though, why is Jesus acting in this way? And why does John place this episode at the beginning of his, his, his account? The money changing service was, was needed. Um, coinage had to be changed into the necessary temple tax and the selling of animals was helpful for those um, Jews wanting to make uh, sacrifices at the temple and, and to worship there. But somehow the whole thing had turned into a massive money-making venture with exorbitant and inflated prices being asked of the thousands and thousands of visitors who came to pray, to thank God and to come close to the presence of God. This story is often told uh, to remind us, signposters if you like, that God wants justice to prevail in the, in the world, which is full of injustice and that he can't bear the exploitation of the poor. The love of money is a root of evil, he says elsewhere. Expressing righteous anger is thus seen as acceptable and important. It still is. And we need to speak up for people who can't speak up for themselves. Who, who can we speak up for this week, this month, this year? Dramatic though Jesus' action is, I don't think it's uncontrolled anger. I don't sense the animals or people were physically hurt. Jesus was probably thinking very carefully what he would say and do as he found something to pick up and make into a whip. It was an unforgettable scene though, and no wonder all four Gospels record an incident of this nature. However, I think there are several other layers of what God is saying here too. 
and lots of what Mike calls hyperlinks back to the Old Testament times. And as the passage moves on, heralds what is to come. It's a time for a massive sea change in temple worship. All this is happening in the court of the Gentiles too, which by this time was a, a sort of vast, expanded plaza-like area. It perhaps looks something like in this picture. We'll come back to that shortly in the second part of the passage. It seems Jesus was angry and upset that the example set by his chosen people to non-Jews, to the Gentiles, was deplorable in the extreme. Or as the disciples put it in, in verse 17, zeal for your house is what is motivating and consuming Jesus, which is a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9. His father's house was meant to be a house of prayer for all nations, which and that was written 700 years before Jesus was there in, in Isaiah 56. The Lord speaks of bringing foreigners to his holy mountain and giving them joy in his house of prayer. Here on the plaza in the court of the Gentiles, Jesus observes inappropriate activity that's blocking the way for people to experience something of his God. By the way, you might be interested to know that both the Hebrew word and the Greek word used for non-Jews or Gentiles is more accurate than the word Gentiles, which we use in English and which comes from a Latin word. The Hebrew word goi or goyim in the plural, translates as nation or nations. And the Greek word used is ethni, which sounds more familiar to our ears, from which the word ethnic or ethnicity is derived. God has always been a God for all peoples, all nations. The same temple area in Jerusalem is often called the Temple Mount, it's the same place as Mount Moriah, the place where Abraham, here comes a hyperlink, where Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son Isaac 2,000 years before this event and where God provided a ram at the last minute. And this foreshadows, of course, and prefigures what God will provide, Jesus, the son of God, as the ultimate sacrifice, the lamb of God, as John the Baptist called him in chapter one. Abraham, in faith and obedience, did what God asked of him. God said that all nations, way back then, God said all nations will be blessed through Abraham, not just the chosen people. That's in Genesis 12. All people will be blessed on earth through you. And here's Jesus standing and speaking in the midst of people from all nations. There will have been thousands and thousands of them in Jerusalem at that time. Mount Moriah is the same place that's referred to in Chronicles 3.1. As Solomon begins to build the temple, it's the same land which David, his father, bought and built an altar on, insisted on buying it at a price the threshing floor remember Paul the apostles reminds us of course that we after Jesus died that we were all bought as a price that's in Corinthians six twenty. things start so well when the first temple is dedicated through Solomon though Solomon seems fully aware that even such a carefully designed and carefully constructed beautiful building cannot fully contain the magnitude of God. But will God really dwell on earth? He prays and then he continues, the heavens, even the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less the temple I have built. It's a long story, but we know that as God's people drift away from his ways and despite prophetic words and warnings, the people don't really listen very often. And through a succession of dodgy 
earthly kings, Solomon's temple is destroyed by the Babylonians 400 or so years later and God's people are exiled for 70 years, hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. Yeah, they drifted away from God's ways. Are there times when we drift away, Lord? I think there are. And I'm not really listening to God or when we get too comfortable in our culture. We're not so comfortable now, are we? But there are things to think about there, things for me to think about there. For the sake of time, I'll have to fast forward through um, Zerubbabel's temple, which was built when the exiles returned and Nehemiah and Ezra um, rebuilding the walls. It was a much more modest temple um, in the city of Jerusalem, but it's probably the temple that had, was in some degree of needing re renovation. And uh, uh, by the time King Herod started expanding it in a rather grandiose way, really, in 20 BC, partially for his own ends, to be honest, and which is referred to in, in verse 20 of chapter 2 of John. Let's get back there. It's taken 46 years to build this temple, is, is, is suddenly said, isn't it, by the, by the Jewish people. So it's approximately 26 AD. Anyway, let's backtrack to the big question in verse 18 from the Jews and move into the second half of the passage. When an explanation is demanded of Jesus to account for himself, have he scattered the animals and turned the tables over and everything and caused general mayhem, the Jews ask him, what miraculous sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? The question is probably from temple officials. It's quite a surprising question, really, into, in, in reaction to what's just happened. Their response could well have been to bundle Jesus away, chuck him out, arrest him, fine him. But they ask this question. I have no idea if these religious men had Malachi's uh, scripture in their minds at all. They were well versed in, in Old Testament scriptures. Um, let's just have a look at it for a moment. Suddenly, it's certainly prophetic. This is Malachi 3 and verse 1. Suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant. He will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Who can stand when he appears? And how does Jesus reply? That's equally surprising. No one understands his reply at all. Um, his reply doesn't seem to follow on from the question in their minds. What does Jesus say? Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. No one understands, as I've just said, including his disciples, and no one has a clue what's going on. Though I sense Jesus was looking them straight in the eye as he said that. Thankfully, John unveils for us, for the, his readers, in verse 22. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. God is a God who loves to reveal things through his word and by his Holy Spirit. Um, it would be a bit of a diversion for me to say that I had a wonderful experience of the Holy Spirit on the first morning that I was a Christian when uh, God reminded me of uh, a, a scripture from way back 20, 20 odd years before and I suddenly understood what it meant. Uh, it was wonderful really. Anyway, there's much more that he wants to reveal to us even here um, and, and beyond the level of understanding that, that Jesus was to die a sacrificial death once and for all and that he would be resurrected, amazing though that is. He referred to his own body as the temple. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. 
things were changing big time. The literal, physical temple in Jerusalem, the building, the need for animal sacrifice would cease. Jesus is the temple now. I myself will die and be raised up in three days. As Jesus died on the cross, the temple curtain, remember, to the Holy of Holies, was torn in two and made a way for us all to come in. No more priests, no high priests or animal sacrifices were needed to atone for sin. Later in John 14 and verse 6, Jesus declares, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. In the same chapter of John, chapter 14, and in the next 2, 15 and 16, Jesus teaches his disciples about the Holy Spirit extensively uh, before he dies. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth, whom my Father will send in my name and will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said. That's how we have John's writings now. He was reminded of things uh, Jesus had said and done. The more I look at chapter two, the more I notice the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit permeating everything and working in unity throughout. We too need the Holy Spirit in us more and more. And whilst it seemed outrageous to the leaders of the day that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God and the way to God, we should be thrilled that we have access to God now and the, and the Holy Spirit through Jesus. And even more thrilled that post-Pentecost, we too, we too are referred to as a temple of the Holy Spirit. In Corinthians, Paul writes, don't you know that you yourselves are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Jesus wants to reside in us through his spirit more and more. So we must make more space for that. He wants us to be holy as he is holy. It doesn't get more sacred than that. No wonder we remind ourselves frequently that the church is not a building. And in 1 Peter 2, 5, we are called living stones being built into a spiritual house. There's a major signpost to the spiritual here, isn't there, in this, in chapter two. We're a royal priesthood. It's amazing, but true. The rather gleaming and impressive buildings that Herod had uh, renovated, that Jesus saw in his day and his disciples elsewhere were saying, look at these big stones. They'd been built, being built for 46 years and the finishing touches would continue to be added for another 20 years. And then, just six years later, this temple, made with human hands, was no more. It was destroyed by the Romans in AD 70. I've got three final thoughts this one came to mind. What would show up if God put me through a holy CT scanner or put our church through a CT scanner? Like the psalmist in Psalm 139, we can be bold and pray, search me. And know me, O God, know my heart. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of understanding. Back in John 2, at the end of the passage, we see in verse 23, many people saw the miraculous signs and believed in his name, but Jesus would not entrust himself to them. Seems odd when they believe, but maybe they're Belief was shallow and didn't last long. Secondly, let's keep asking to be filled and refilled with the Holy Spirit. 
the water jars at Cana, if we just go back to the first part of chapter two, were filled to the brim and there was an overflow of provision. As we look at John juxtaposing that wedding in Cana with the cleansing of the temple, we can hyperlink forwards to Revelation 21, where again there's a wedding and a temple mentioned in one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. It'd be worth reading it all through. It refers to Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The church, God's church, is referred to as the as the bride. Now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. And in verse 22 of uh, Revelation 21, John writes, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The glory of an honour of the nations will be, brought, will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it. God is the one who wants to cleanse and heal and wipe away every tear. But it's a two-way relationship. And we have a responsibility to make ourselves ready ready to make ourselves ready. Lastly, while the temple officials in John chapter 2 were quick to find fault, to point the finger, it happens throughout John's gospel, doesn't it, and spot blemishes, we must be people with a different attitude. God wants none to perish. He didn't want the Gentiles to stay in the outer precincts. He wants everyone to come close. We mustn't judge. We mustn't point the finger. We mustn't blame. Let's keep pointing people to Jesus. To the truth of who Jesus is and the incomparable riches of his grace. We were made by him and for him and to worship him in both spirit and truth. Amen. Thanks for that, Rona. Real challenge to us all. Well, we're coming nearly to the end of our, our service this morning. We're going to sing together uh, Richard, if we could just have, um, I'll have the one, Holy Yours, please.
of the meeting just reminding ourselves that God at this time is speaking to the church and somehow wanting the church us to see what that new normal is going to be for us into the future and I want to thank uh, many of you uh, that have put some prophetic words that are being spoken around uh, the nation at the moment I want to thank Richard particularly for highlighting Steve Upple uh, prophetic word. If you haven't uh, seen that on the chat, need to have a look at it. There's a clear word of God for us as a church on that. And um, I also want to thank, I think it's Estelle who put uh, the Mike Filibacci and J. John um, video on, which we're going to watch now. Because the challenge for us as a church is to be be able to be brave and bold of what this new future is going to look like for us all right um and it's going to mean some changes for us exciting changes but change is never very very easy but it's very very exciting the prophetic word which i i truly believe that the church is picking up is that God is about to pour his spirit on this nation and worldwide where revival, God's kingdom will come and we as a church need to be prepared as a vessel to embrace that. And I'd like us to listen to this just a little three minute video uh, by Mike Filibacci and J. John, just having a conversation of what they think God is saying to the church at this time. The gospel is powerful. The gospel does not change. We mustn't lose confidence in the good news of Jesus. And possibly what we've done in many of our churches is in order, and I'm... I, I believe in being culturally relevant, but sometimes in order to be culturally relevant, we've forgotten that we are also meant to be culturally prophetic yes. and distinctive. And, and actually the gospel goes against, you know, the gospel is not about right-wing politics. Yeah. The gospel is not about left-wing politics. The gospel is not about middle of the road politics. The gospel is about another flipping kingdom altogether. Yeah. And it's about the kingdom of God. Yeah. And we've got to rise up. There's got to be a, a renewed move of the spirit, which is about radical Christianity. And we need a generation to rise up who are radically committed to the scriptures and to all the scriptures and you know what we don't we don't come to judge the bible yeah do i like that don't i we come to the bible to let the bible judge us yes and when we became christians i don't know about i know it was the same for you yeah we talked about we, we would look at the bible and it's like oh i can't do that okay yeah i've got to change fine. oh i'm meant to do that I need to change. Yeah. And we've got to get back to we a do. radical yeah. commitment to Jesus. And your little series yeah. on some of the, the saints heroes of the, of the, the faith. heroes of the I faith know. and the revivals of the oh. past. And and you know, revival isn't a spray that God's gonna spray in the atmosphere. Revival comes as we yeah. go. Yeah. And and actually God is faithful. He is so faithful, and we've got to trust in his faithfulness. 
and we need to be an alternative community. Yeah. That, and it's not complicated. It's the great commandment, we love him with all that we have and all that we are. The new commandment, that we love one another as he loves us, so family, and the great commission to go into every ethnicity, every yes. people group, and make disciples of everyone. And the message hasn't changed. We just complicated it. And we so wanted to be popular. And it's funny, in the Acts of the Apostles, yeah. you know, there was such power and it, what they preached was so contrary yeah. to the Roman Empire and even the Jewish leaders that they were hated, but there was an awe. Yeah. And a purity, and, and wasn't a purity. there? Oh. And people came in droves to Christ. And I think the Lord is out of this. And I want to give my remaining years to helping to raise up a generation who are radically committed to Christ, his church, and his cause. Amen. Absolutely. So, Lord, we want to be those radical people. Go out into the byways and bring people to Christ. So as we started off this meeting, Lord, saying, pour out your spirit, please do that for us. Lord, we want to be ready. We want to clear out anything that's not right in our lives so that you can come in. And we want to be a church that's hearing what you're saying to us into the future. Amen. So thank you, everybody, for taking part thank you for louis and and andy and rona and everybody do you want to unmute yourself and then we'll have a cacophony of just saying the blessing um over each other that would be really good before we have the notices so if we unmute so we'll start off grace, grace of our Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ. God bless you all. I think I've got any notices, Ron. I can't live without notices. Can't live without notices. We can't live without the Holy Spirit, that's for sure. Yeah, Richard, uh, I'm sure you've got some for us. Um, really strange i'm looking at my now it's uh, there we go here we come oh nice <laughs> i believe that was an important word about not blocking the way for people so thanks for doing that at the beginning um yeah prayer tomorrow night andrea will be leading that really powerful really important to keep praying together come along if you can tomorrow night too it's alpha beginning it's not too late for people to join alpha maybe but be bold today invite somebody or tomorrow uh, remember Sue Lewis was one who came when she was asked just before Alpha started. We love that. Uh, and, and we'll be praying for you, Mike and Jen and Paul and yeah. Kevin, who are ho hosting it. And then um, various uh, meetings this week. It's good to meet together. Um, and uh, we, these people meet once a month. So thank you, Jen and the musicians who will be meeting on Wednesday and techie people. And um, prayer coordinators uh, meeting Thursday morning notice we've just um, tweaked the time a little bit on that and on Friday at three o'clock the the new media team is meeting too. Yeah, a massive big thank you on the next one I can't include everybody that I'd like to thank but I want to we, we need to keep thanking and praying for the food bank team people who are quietly and have been doing this for nearly a year now working on the friendship phone line in the community um, for Sue Izard's voluntary help with the, the finance of the church, for James coming in and doing some painting jobs at the centre, for Chris keeping the place clean, for Pam preparing mm -hmm. centre point materials, mm -hmm. and for the winter pastoral house, and Richard for just about everything else. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't manage without Richard. We couldn't manage without Richard. It's <laughs> 
And then uh, today, some of you may be interested, thank you for flagging this up, Paul. Uh, we, we've um, been associated with Green Pastures and some of you still are. They work on providing homes for people that uh, need homes uh, right across mm. the nation and partner with people. And they're featured on Songs of Praise today. So that's mm -hmm. 115 on BBC One. And then finally, uh, we'll mention this again, um, but uh, some of you know, a lot of you know Alan Hoare, and um, we'd love him to talk with us one Sunday. We're going to ask him actually, but he's, he's written a new book. Um, I think it's part Ooh. of a series of three. So if you're interested in that, if you're on Facebook, you can find Alan there and order it that way. But if you want to order a book via the office, just, just give me a ring and we'll sort that out for you. Dirk I see, that sounds good, doesn't it? Next week, looking forward to Mike. Thank you for everything this morning, Mike, leading us through. And thank you, everyone else, as well, for being here. It's good to be together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Great. Just to keep you updated on the Alpha, there could be, we've definitely got, I think, seven people Ooh. coming. Um, it could go up to nine or it could go even up to 11. But... Even at these last moments, you know, I think Sue Lewis is the prophetic person for us. She was asked the day before or the hours before the Alpha course started and came on. And um, we know what happened through that. So be bold, be brave to ask people. Um, I'm getting bolder in my old age to ask people. Um, it's exciting times. So have a great week. Uh, keep praying, keep on seeking, keep listening to what God's saying. And as you're hearing, please communicate what you're hearing for us. We need to uh, do that. So God bless you all. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you.